All right, good evening, Horticulture 164, Hort Pest Management. This is a uh, PowerPoint that I've put together entitled Turf Grass Cultural Management and Insect Pest. This uh, directly is related to chapters two and three in your Ornamentals and Turf Pest Management Handbook, your textbook. Uh, it's the, the specialty part of your pesticide licensing exam. You know, we have just covered um, the, uh, the core principles or your core exam, which will consist of a 100 question exam if you take your pesticide uh, licensing exam. And then you have the second part, which is your specialty, which is 50 questions. Uh, but this comes directly, uh, it's directly related to chapters two and three, so you need to go ahead and read those chapters. Um, look at this PowerPoint. I've included a lot of extra information uh, that you're not going to be tested on. So when we come across something that you are going to be tested on, I am going to uh, to uh, to let you guys know. <clears throat> but I've included a lot of information that's going to help you um, if you choose to to do pest management as a career. Uh, I get in a little depth about warm season and cool season grasses. You know there are test questions and you know directly from your book. Uh, but I've thrown in some extra stuff, and like I said, I'll be fair and tell you uh, that this is testable material or not. But uh, my name's Eric Jones. I'm your instructor, and uh, this is uh, Turf Grass Cultural Management and Insect uh, Pests. All right, plant classification. Plants, they are classified by placing those with similar characteristics in the same group. Um, one of these classifications is the, uh, the angiosperms. They are our flowering plants. Both, both shrubs and grasses flower. Uh, so we've, we've even broken down these flowering plants of grasses and, um, and broadleaves into uh, another classification or separated it into to, to two different classes. And those are the monocots and the dicots. And for those of you uh, who have already taken uh, Hort 162, um, Applied Plant Science, this is familiar information. If not, just pay close attention. Uh, our grasses that we're studying right now are considered monocots. These are your grass-like plants. Uh, in a couple weeks when we start talking about pest management for ornamental shrubs, those are our dicots. Uh, and even our weeds, that may develop in our turf grasses um, can be dicots, you know, broadleaf weeds, broadleaf plants. But, um, you know, we're talking about insects and cultural practices of, of a monocot plant or grasses uh, for this PowerPoint. All right, your true grasses, they are in the family Poe uh, Poaceae. Sometimes I'll get tongue tied. Uh, a lot of these uh, botanical names can uh, tongue tie you, but Poaceae uh, is uh, the family of grasses or true grasses. The, uh, the genus and species uh, create the scientific name. For example, Poa parentheses or pre Pretenesis uh, is your Kentucky bluegrass. Um, you know, one of my favorite grasses again, uh, but Poa Pretenesis is your Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, a final subdivision is the, uh, the cultivar. Your, uh, your cultivars are considered to be of the uh, same species because they are very similar in structure and physiology. And I always relate uh, plant science um, to, to, to us. Um, you know, we have our anatomy and our physiology. Well, so do plants. Plants have their anatomy, they have their physiology. Anatomy is nothing more than the structure or the parts. Um, parts of the grass, the, the leaf, the crown, the blade, uh, the stolen, all those are parts of your grasses. Just like we have a heart, we have a kidney, all that, those are our parts. The physiology is how these parts work. What makes, what makes these parts work? Um, you can't have one without the other. They are so closely related, uh, the structure and physiology. But however, within your cultivars, some of these traits are different, such as your shade tolerance, your leaf width, your cold hardiness, your disease resistance, your heat and drought tolerance, and your establishment rate. 
And with these cultivars, these are, this is where a lot of these uh, PhDs and doctorates of turf grasses, you know, they specialize in. They've created a uh, new cultivar of a certain species of grass that is now resistant to ABC disease or, or whatever. Uh, or they may have worked on a particular grass that can only be grown in the sun, but now they've got a cultivar that does okay in part shade. Um, so that's how you'll see a lot of these uh, new grasses developed is, you know, people doing the research and, and developing these new cultivars. And another, another name for cultivar simply is the variety. The variety is another name for the cultivar. All right, plant growth. The systems and structures of a grass are composed of various tissues. Meristematic tissue is responsible for plant growth. The cells that are in the meristematic tissue divide and enlarge, resulting in growth. The crown, which we'll see a picture of the crown here in a minute, is the major meristematic region in a grass plant. This is where all the growing is taking place. And the crown being located at the base of the plant allows us to mow our turf grasses on a regular basis. What if this crown was on top and that was the, the first thing that we see? If we cut that off, the plant's no longer gonna grow. So the actual crown being located at the bottom of the grass next to the soil, and that's where the grass is actually growing from, allows us to mow it. So your newest grass, you know, people always think, well, the, the newest the, the youngest part of the grass is, is the very tip. No, that's the oldest part of the grass. The newest or the newly formed part of the grass is at the bottom. It's growing from the bottom and it's growing upward. So we're actually cutting the older part of the grass off. All right, here we have a good, good diagram of the important structures uh, of a typical grass plant. You know, starting with the top, the inflorescence, you know, it's what I call the seed head. Um, it's setting on a comb. Down below that you see the leaf. The leaf is attached at the node and from the leaf we'll have the, the grass blade or the, you know the green part that we're seeing. Uh, within our blade we'll have a mid vein or a mid rib and just below that is our sheath. And then down at the very bottom we have our tillers. There's that crown. It's sitting right on top of the soil and from that crown you see different stalins jumping over and starting new grass plants. And then you have a rhizome underneath is another way for the plant to uh, to grow and to uh, expand itself. But this is something that you guys can be tested on. This could either be in a pop quiz next week, this could be on a uh, exam, but to actually label uh, the parts of a grass plant. These are the important structures and these are the, uh, the parts that you guys need to know. All right, photosynthesis. I'm not going to beat this in the ground. This is something that uh, you know we should remember from high school science, and uh, you know we talk about it a lot more in Hort 162 plant science. But photosynthesis is nothing but energy from sunlight that is used to combine carbon dioxide and water to form carbohydrates. Carbohydrates is the food. You know we take in carbohydrates. That's how. That's how we how we survive. Well, the plants need carbohydrates too. Good thing about plants, they can make their own carbon dioxide with the sunlight. But photosynthesis can slow or even stop when environmental conditions are unfavorable. Hey, the plant's not going to be able to photosynthesize if it's too cold, if it's too hot, or either of the like. Um, just know the definition of photosynthesis. We're not going to get into the physiology of how this works. That's something that will be taken care of in, in 162. Um, the only thing you could be questioned, I mean, tested on here is the actual definition of photosynthesis. Respiration um, is simply the carbohydrates are being broken down to release energy that is used for plant growth and development. Um, this is something that I'm actually studying in my graduate class this summer um, is, is cellular respiration and, and how plants and how animals can use uh, carbohydrates within uh, with, and how, how they are used up in cellular respiration. Roots. 
grasses consist of an extensive fibrous root system. Um, remember that it's fibrous. You know, some of your broadleaf uh, weeds and shrubs, they're going to have tap roots, and we'll learn about that a little bit later. Um, but on these fibrous root system, you have root hairs. They're doing most of the work uh, for the grass plant. They're, uh, they're doing all the absorption. They're absorbing the water, the mineral nutrients from the soil, and they're also holding that plant uh, together in the soil. They're giving it support. Uh, it's a mechanical support, and it anchors that plant to the soil. Root growth. Optimal temperature for warm season grasses is 80 degrees. Optimal root growth for cool season grasses is 55 degrees. Depth of your roots uh, can be influenced by factors such as the species itself, the mowing height, irrigation, soil temperature, airification, and the fertilizer program that uh, you've established. Testable information here for cool season and warm season grasses. Warm season, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Cool season, 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Vascular system. More plant science topics. Xylem, water and minerals are absorbed by the roots and they are carried up in the xylem to the stems and the leaves. Your phloem, food manufactured in the leaves, travels down in the phloem to the stems and roots. Need to know these definitions. Uh, once again, we're not going to get into the physiology of it, but you need to know what they are. Leaves. Leaves are the major site of photosynthesis or food production. Leaf cells are made up of the epidermis, the cuticle, the stomata, and the midrib. Parts that you guys covered in plant materials and plant science. Grass leaf is divided into two major parts. The blade, which is the upper, relatively flat part of the leaf, and the sheath, the lower portion. When grass is cut, the mower blade removes the oldest tissue. And I said that previously in a couple slide, uh, earlier slides. Leaf cells, we need to know that, that it is the epidermis, the cuticle, the stomata, and the midrib. Could be a pop quiz question, could be a test question. Stems, the crown is an elongated stem. The flowering comb produces the seeds, or that seed head from that diagram that we showed earlier. Stalins are lateral or creeping above ground stems. Rhizomes are lateral stems in the soil. Stalins and rhizomes enable grass plants to spread. More of your warm season grasses are going to spread with stalins and rhizomes. Uh, it's just, just a characteristic of warm season grasses. Uh, you need to know these definitions. These are pop quiz and testable questions. Other structures. Tillers, they're the shoots that grow vertically right next to the mother plant. They make the grasses uh, perennial by replacing dead and dying shoots. The inflorescent is the flowering part of a grass plant where seeds are formed. And at normal mowing heights, turf, gra uh, turf grasses do not commonly produce seeds. If you see some lawn that's producing or you see seed heads, it hasn't been mowed in quite a while. All right, measuring turf quality. There are some characteristics that are used to measure turf. One is color. Does it have good green color? Or does it have a good bluish color, depending on the, the, uh, the type that you're using? The texture, is the texture soft? Is it coarse? Uh, the density, is, is the yard, does the yard look full? Or does it look sparse? I mean, is there just a little bit of grass here and there? or is it just you know completely covered? Uniformity, how uniform does it look? How well groomed? Uh, these are all things that you're gonna look out when you're, when you're going to do an estimate for a customer. Some of the things that you can talk to your clients about. Levels of maintenance of turf grass. High maintenance, 
your golf course greens, your tees, your fairways, your top quality sports turf, your medium. These are lawns or sport fields that do not require outstanding turf. Then you have low, low levels, uh, which are utility areas such as roadsides, underneath power lines, um, you know, water treatment plants or whatever, just enough. Uh, you know, the, the turf is primarily used for erosion control, stuff like that. Um, this can also, uh, and this is, this is you know, non-testable information, but, you know, we characterize our loans by level of maintenance. You know, we have some high, high-end clients that, yeah, we're going to treat like it's a golf course. Do they have the type of lawns that golf courses have or, or uh, some of the tee boxes or anything like that? No, but these are, you know, high levels of maintenance. We're going to do a great job. Then we have medium lawns. These are, you know, uh, not so expensive neighborhoods, but you know they can afford their lawns to be cut. But do they want to spend the money plugging and seeding every year? No. Then you have some lower, uh, lower levels of maintenance, which could be a schoolhouse, um, you know, somewhere that they don't have a lot of visitors. They just want the grass cut, mow, blow, and go type jobs. Um, so you know, we characterize our lawns with high, medium, low. I'd much rather do a high or a low level maintenance job than I would the medium because the higher level maintenance client has the money to pay for everything that needs to be done. The low end customers, all they are worried about is a mow, blow, and go job. Well, the medium customers, they want everything to look perfect, but they don't necessarily have enough money. Um, to cover all the needs that need to take place to give them that lush green lawn. So I'd much rather take care of a higher level of maintenance or a lower level of maintenance lawn compared to the medium ones. Uh, some of the best money you'll ever make mowing is a yard that is nothing but mow, blow, and go. You cut it for $25, you weed eat it every couple weeks but it's mow, blow, and go, and you're done. And you do five or six an hour versus one high end or a couple medium ends where you know you may only be getting 35 to 40 bucks. You can cut a whole lot more lower level properties in the hour than you can the two above it. But that's enough on that. Sorry I got tracked off that, but um, your levels of maintenance can be related to your properties as well as the turf grass itself. All right, now we're getting into our warm season grasses. If you can look at the map here, uh, look at C, uh, you know, the warm humid, it comes right up almost to like where we're located. You know, we're probably to the west a little bit. Uh, and this map's probably changed, you know, the, the, the plant, uh, plant maps have changed, but uh, you know, we're in that transition zone. We can use warm season grasses or we can use cool season grasses. And I think that's, that's good for us being in the landscape industry is that, you know, we see a variety of different grasses. You know, we can take a zoysia lawn, make it look great. We can take a tall fescue lawn or fine fescue lawn, make it look great. Have different lawn care programs for each one and still have a good resume of the different types of grasses that we can take care of. All right, your warm season uh, turf grass adaptation. They grow best in the southern United States. Yeah, you know, Florida on up to, to about where we're at. Uh, maybe some uh, warm season grasses on the coast of Virginia, possibly. Uh, but the optimal growth occurs when air temperatures are 80 degrees or higher. Same thing with the root temperature, right? And most become dormant at uh, dormant when the average daily temperatures drop to 50. So when the average temperature is 50 degrees, these warm season grasses are going to turn brown, a characteristic that a lot of people do not like. So that's why they favor the cooler season grasses where we're at. The cold tolerance and other characteristics vary among the species and cultivar. True, different, different warm season grasses have different cold tolerances. Uh, you know, Bermuda grass will take it a little bit more, uh, so a little more than your uh, 
then you're seeing St. Augustine grass. Um, Wilmington, you'll see a lot of St. Augustine. It's a very, very good grass for lawns. You're not going to see it here, but you will see the Bermudas in both. You'll see them here and on the coast. Back to um, these warm season grasses going dormant. Um, there's mixed feelings about that. You have clients that don't like the grass turning brown. You have the clients that love the warm season grasses for summertime. To me, it always reminds me that I'm at the beach, so I'm, I'm favorable towards them, but I love my tall fescues as well. You know, if I ever get to build my dream home one day, I'm gonna have warm season grasses around that pool that I long, long for. But in my front yard, when neighbors go by, I want that tall fescue that I can stripe up and make it look like a, you know, a baseball field with the striping. Um, but with our warm season grasses, there's nothing wrong with having a warm season grass and overseeding with annual or perennial rye uh, to give you some color over the winter. That rye grass is going to become uh, it'll die out when the temperatures get warm enough in the late spring. So you can have your warm season overseeding with rye grass and keep green grass year round. Do they want to pay for it? You know, it just depends. So, you know, it's a big issue. Do we have a warm season grass and overseed with the rye or do we overseed every year with a, a fescue? It just depends. It's, it's personal preference when you get down to it. Establishment. <clears throat> Several warm season species produce only small quantities of seed or seed that is difficult to germinate. That's why we're going to establish these uh, vegetatively by using small pieces of sod called plugs. Think back to equipment class. We're taking the plugger. You know, those are plugs pulling out. Well, they've got machines that actually do core plugs specifically to sell this uh, warm season grasses. Sprigs, which are pieces of rhizomes and stalums. We've sprigged a, um, a croquet court uh, with Bermuda. Uh, we've done it several times. Um, you actually take the sprigs, you prepare the soil, you get it perfect, uh, almost preparing the seed bed, and then you take these sprigs that come in these big bags, uh, well they were at the time we did it, and you sprinkle it like pine needles. I mean, you, you know, you just get a big armful and you sprinkle it on the area that you need the grass. Then we covered it with sand. We top dressed it with sand, watered it in, took care of it like it was our baby, and watched it. And then all of a sudden you start seeing, seeing green start popping up. Real, uh, real good way to do this. It's a lot less expensive. Uh, um, than the sod, which sod is nothing but thin strips of turf grass and soil. We took the sod cutter out in equipment class. There's big sod cutters mounted on tractors that can, you know, fill a pallet full, uh, you know, in a minute or so. So there are sod forms uh, growing, um, growing the sod to take to new homes and golf courses and this is the quickest and easiest way to get a, you know, to have grass overnight. Sprigs, you know, it's going to take a little while. The plugs, yeah, you're going to see these green circles all over and eventually it'll cover, but sod is the quickest and uh, probably the most efficient way if you think about it. I mean, because it can be done quickly. Um, you're going to get paid sooner because you've laid the sod out. You've got green grass. Client's going to pay you. Sometimes you know they may want to hold a little bit, waiting for the sprigs or the, the plugs to take. But either way, this is how you're going to establish warm season grasses. You can actually do sod for cool season grasses as well. We'll talk about that in a, in a few. Um, but the sad thing with sod, it is 100% directly related to new construction. Um, you know, you may have some landscape renovation jobs that you'll get, you know, a little bit of sod. But, you know, here recently there's been several sod farms that, that's closed just because new construction has stopped. Bermuda grass. Um, 
you know, the hybrid cultivars are the result of crosses between Bermuda grass species. Anytime you talk about hybrids, you're either talking about a croquet court, a golf green, a golf tee, or sports complex uh, are going to be using your hybrids. Uh, they are propagated vegetatively and exhibit improved characteristics. So they're taking, you know, just plain old Bermuda grass and they've developed it uh, for particular use. And these cultivars are going to be propagated vegetatively, either by sprigging, sodding, or doing the plugs. Um, these hybrids, they're going to produce that high quality turf and require a higher level of maintenance than most other warm season grasses. Um, probably not what you're going to see in a residential lawn. You're probably just going to see, well, if you're seeing Bermuda grass come up in somebody's lawn right now that's not been vegetatively put there you know, on purpose, um, you know, it's just, it's just your, your, your straight up common Bermuda grass. And people around here will, um, think about it as a uh, think of it as a weed we had an instance where a uh, client we've had several several years um, Bermuda grass was just a problem it never bothered the client they just wanted it mowed fertilized plugged and seed every fall we talked to them about spraying the Bermuda grass giving them a quote it, it doesn't bother me you, you guys are doing a great job you know overseed if it turns brown it turns brown we had a guy that was working for us that um, come from one of the local golf courses, and he's like, Eric, let the Bermuda take it. He's like, quit fighting it. We, we thought about it. And, um, you know, Bermuda is pretty much um, taken over. Uh, we do overseed it. We overseed it with a little mixture of uh, uh, ryegrass and fescue. Um, gives, them, gives them a nice little green tint over the winter. Uh, when it dies, you'll still see a little bit of Bermuda that's brown, but you know, in a couple weeks it's turned and you know it's it's green grass. Um, good thing about that, it's you know it's choked the fescue out. If we had to skip that yard a week, you really can't tell, you know, because the Bermuda is not it's not going to produce such a significant seed head as some of your fescue or other cool season grasses. So, it uh, you know it works pretty good. Alright, some more information on Bermuda grass. These improved hybrids are used on better quality lawns, sports areas, and on golf courses, and common Bermuda grass produces a lower quality turf. Common Bermuda grass, probably stuff that you're going to see at a schoolhouse or something like that that's not plugging and seeding or trying to fight the Bermuda grass. If you get a little bit of Bermuda grass, common Bermuda grass in a yard, it is going to take over. And like I said, to me, that doesn't bother me. Yes, there's going to be some clients that absolutely, you know, will not stand for it. Some, like the previous um, client that I uh, told you guys about, it didn't bother them. To me, it doesn't bother me. Um, but like I said, if I go back to ever having my dream home one day, yeah, I will put more effort um, into my lawn. It's kind of hard to take care of. Um, the acre that my house sits on and the adjacent two acres that, that me and dad, you know, alternate mowing together. So we kind of let that grass go. Um, but Bermuda grass, it requires less maintenance than the hybrids, just straight common Bermuda grass. It doesn't require the maintenance. You know, it's not a golf course grass. Uh, common can be propagated by seed. That's another good thing. I actually have a bag in my, in my uh, office. Um, uh, to show you guys and you know we got a little patch down below that we need to work on uh, for our labs but uh, you know it doesn't necessarily have to be propagated vegetatively it can be you know it can be produced vegetatively uh, but we can also uh, seed it and both of these uh, Bermuda grasses have stalins and rhizomes and are poor in the shade and say poor in the shade now but here this year there has been developed a Bermuda grass that is more tolerable to shade and I think once that really becomes known and hits the market you'll see a lot of uh, Bermuda grass lawns taking place because that's the one bad thing about it. you have a Bermuda lawn you've got a maple tree out in the middle you're gonna have these poor thin areas of the Bermuda grass um, 
so people don't like that and you have to have bigger mulch areas and stuff like that so if they perfect this Bermuda to grow in the shade you know it's it just you know it's another tool in our back pocket that um, you know we can offer our clients St. Augustine um, the characteristic of it, it it's coarse textured has strong stallings and is excellent in the shade just like I said previously with the uh, the Bermuda grass if you have a client that does want a warm season grass and has a lot of shade this is the grass you need but here's the thing it is only used in the warmest areas of the warm season zone I know places that have this in Wilmington and it is a major long grass of the deep deep south so you know South Carolina Georgia Florida you know it's probably one of the better grasses to use the thing here we can only propagate it with sprigs plugs or sod it can only be grown vegetatively in someone's yard um, you will not see that grass here in Winston-Salem uh, you may see it experimented with try to grow it may last a season but it's it's it gets too cold for it here uh, but uh, I do uh, know of landscape maintenance contractors that have St. Augustine lawns in Wilmington and um, you know it's a thriving grass there Baja grass Paspalum notatum characteristics of this grass it's adapted to warmer regions of the south again probably not going to see it here in Winston-Salem uh, has a coarse um, tough leaf blades it spreads by short rhizomes and stalins very drought uh, very drought tolerant so if you're on the coast and you have a client that does not want to deal with irrigation this is a species that you may want to use the bad thing about it it can produce very ugly seed heads um, and if you you know you have a client that hey I don't want irrigation I only want you to mow my yard once every two weeks this is a grass you're not going to use because it's going to produce those ugly seed heads you would want to go with a different grass another good point about this grass it's relatively resistant to pest so if you have a client that can deal with some seed head issues they don't have to worry about irrigation or pest this is the grass that you would want to use and I hope you guys are starting to see the different characteristics of some of these grasses um, I will try to put some pictures on blackboard uh, if not you know maybe some slides next class um, to show you the different pictures of these grasses if not hey take a look look in your books look it up online um, there are some books that actually have great pictures uh, of these grasses but I'm not so worried much about you guys being able to recognize those grasses right offhand but to understand the different characteristics of why you would want to use some of these grasses on your properties all right seashore past palum characteristics it's coarse fine textured type it is very tolerant of high salt levels so where would we want to use this would we want to use it in the mountains no we want to use this on the coast you know you have salt spray you have salt air it's not going to hurt this uh, seashore uh, past palum it's popular where the salt levels prohibit the growth of other species certain certain types of grasses won't grow uh, right next to the coast uh, but it is propagated from Stalin's rhizomes or seed to, uh, or sod I apologize sod we cannot seed it um, there may be some cultivars being developed with seed but as of right now only from Stalin's rhizomes or sod and a good thing about this um, this grass here I have heard of instances of where people are actually irrigating with ocean water um, this this is pretty cool um, to actually be able to take ocean water water their seashore grass and not use drinking water um, what else would benefit the client of using ocean water for irrigation you're not going to have any weeds that's going to grow so you're going to actually have your seashore grass that's not going to develop weeds because of the high salt levels and uh, you know you're going to have this either a coarse 
depending on what type you want, or a fine texture. So a fine textured seashore paspalum lawn is a great idea if you're living on you know intercoastal waterway or you know next to Myrtle Beach. Perfect grass for that. All right, centipede grass. Uh, some characteristics of centipede. It's primarily vegetatively um, grown. I do have some centipede grass uh, seed in my office to show you guys um, at a later date, but uh, it's primarily uh, established uh, by vegetative means. It has a poor wear tolerance. So um, is that something you want to plant? Uh, you know, do you want to sod a schoolhouse with centipede grass? No. A lot of foot traffic is going to damage this grass. Um, it needs to be in places, you know, only, uh, you know, where it's not going to have the traffic. Um, a minimal maintenance species. It doesn't require a lot of maintenance, um, but still yet it has that poor wear tolerance. And it's, it's, it's used where quality is not important. It's, it, it's not a pretty of a grass as St. Augustine or, um, or some of your hybrid Bermudas. It's, um, you know, on the roadside. You know, it'd be perfect. You know, on on the, on the interstate, uh, on the other side of the guardrail. For one, yeah, you know, it's minimal maintenance. Uh, the quality isn't that important. All the, you know, all we want is something green there. It doesn't have to be lush and green. And you know, on the side of the highway, there's not going to be too many people walking uh, to damage it. So, you know, depending on where you need, this is a grass that you would use in, in instances like that. Typically, not a grass that I would want. Uh, at my dream home. Zoysia, probably my favorite um, warm season grass that there is. Japanese long grass, also known as that. Uh, zoysia japonica. Uh, it is the most widely used zoysia grass. Uh, the best low temperature tolerance of the warm season grasses. You see a lot of it here in Winston-Salem. It's, it's starting to, uh, um, to, um, to become known. It's vegetatively propagated. Uh, manila grass is a different kind. It is a finer textured and less cold tolerant. Um, probably still used here a lot in the area. Uh, and it just has you know, a finer texture. It's not as coarse as the, the Japanese long grass. Um, if you've ever been over to, uh, to Lisa Swarthout's house, um, you know, our other instructor, she has that in her lawn. And we actually took care of a client that actually had, had it. And it was, you know, we mowed it maybe three or four times a year for him. We didn't do it every week. Um, you know, he'd call us and say, hey, just come. To, you know, it's got a few shoots. I need it just kind of uh, dressed up. And uh, primarily for edging, you know, take a weed eater and kind of keep it from spreading into his pine um, pine needle areas. Um, you know, we did that three or four times for him. And, um, um, and I believe we actually overseeded with rye. A time or two for him uh, just to get rid of the brown but eventually he got used to it turning brown and it, it was fine but uh, one of my favorite grasses the first time I'd ever been introduced to this I was uh, um, we went in uh, uh, the spring of uh, fall of 96 to the American Society of Landscape Architects uh, convention I was a senior at uh, North Carolina A&T and while we weren't at the convention, we were going around visiting different landscape firms, different landscape architecture offices, and uh, we were still in Orange County, south of Los Angeles. But we went to, uh, and, uh, if you guys are ever familiar with the the TV show The OC, we went where uh, a lot of that was filmed, um, and we went to a park that was right on the the Pacific Ocean, and um, you know, our instructor, uh, Dr. Ware. She was um, showing us this grass, and it was zoysia, and we were all like, wow, you know, we've never seen it because it wasn't that popular back here uh, on the East Coast yet. And uh, she said, this is zoysia grass. She said it's used extensively in California uh, because we don't have to mow it. Um, you know, she said it stayed, and it stayed green year-round, you know, uh, especially there in, in uh, Southern California. Stayed green all year. She said they'd mow it, you know, maybe three times a year. Didn't need that much water, and uh, any time you know, that the state or, uh, you know, city government would put in a park or whatever, they would use zoysia grass. And, you know, that was my first introduction to it and uh, really became fond of the grass, uh, you know, from there on out. Uh, common carpet grass, some characteristics. It's, you know, poor, low temperature and drought tolerance. 
it's unattractive due to coarse texture and the many coarse seed heads produced. Um, used on minimal maintenance sites, especially if poorly drained. So this is a, uh, a time, um, you know, a time that you would use this grass is if you have a, a wet, soggy site. I'm not too familiar with carpet grass. It's just not something that we see around here. But remember, if you have a client that wants a warm season grass and they've got a low, wet spot or the yard just seems to stay wet, this is a grass that you would want to use. All right. Kikikuyu grass, a little bit harder name to say, probably more so even than the, uh, the botanical name of Penicetum clandestinum. But the characteristics of this, poor cold tolerance, found in coastal California, often growing as a weed. Hence, weed, something that we're not gonna wanna use. It spreads very aggressively, and due to close mowing tolerance, it can be used on golf course fairways. And you'll see this a lot, guys. You'll see a grass that can be listed as a weed, but listed for a golf course fairway or green, depending on the maintenance of how we take care of this grass. Being mowed closely and being allowed to handle such a low mowing tolerance or close mowing, having you know, being able to be mowed or scalped is why they're using it on the fairways. You know, it's an aggressive grower. It grows really fast, so they can mow it closer. But if it's grown in somebody's yard that's mowing it once a week, it's not something uh, that's going to be considered a luxury. It's grass. It's going to be considered a weed. Uh, definitely something we're not going to see around here. Buffalo grass. Characteristics are excellent drought tolerance. Tolerates the heat and cold. It's a very slow vertical growth rate, and it's used on unirrigated areas. Wow, sounds like the perfect grass, don't it? Um, it can withstand the drought. It likes the hot and the cold. Uh, doesn't need to be mowed that much, and you don't have to have it in, um, you can plant it in areas that has no irrigation. It's a grass used a lot in the Midwest, uh, for one. Midwest gets extremely hot during the summer and it gets extremely cold during the winters. Uh, don't have to mow it. I mean, seems like the perfect grass. I'd like to see some of this maybe used a little more around here, uh, but who knows? But a very good grass. All right, winter overseeding. And this is what I talked about earlier with our warm season grasses. In many southern areas, the warm season grasses become dormant or they go brown. They get that tan color um, as soon as the first frost hits. Um, dormant turf is easily damaged if it receives much traffic. So take for instance, you've got a customer that has a Bermuda lawn, it goes dormant, then the leaf fall starts happening. Then you take these riding mowers to suck up the leaves. When you have a dormant turf that's being highly ran over back and forth with a lawn tractor getting up leaves can damage it very very easily. Uh, your sports areas and higher quality lawns may be seeded with a cool season grass in the fall. Perennial ryegrass, annual ryegrass. Can anybody tell me the difference between annual and perennial rye? The perennial rye will come back year after year. Your annual perennial grass will die uh, when it gets warm. Whenever that heat kicks in, the annual uh, ryegrass is gone. You'll have to reseed it again. The perennial rye will come back year after year. Um, I, would, I would go with the annual uh, just, to, just to be safe in case the client doesn't want to overseed next year. Or um, A lot of times you'll see builders or developers, they'll use a, peren they'll use a ryegrass in their mixture because ryegrass will be up in three or four days. I mean, it, it comes up quick. Um, and if they're using it just for lawn establishment to get something green and they've seeded with a, you know, a fine fescue or something, you want that to come on board quicker. So you'd use annual rye because once the heat hits it, it's dead and gone. It gives a chance for your uh, fine fescues to, to take charge and to become established. That perennial rye, if you put that in a mixture of um, newly seeded lawns there will be some competition created you know with that perennial coming back every year uh, 
in the spring, the turf transitions back to the warm season grass. So using that perennial rye, uh, it goes dormant, frost turns the Bermuda grass, and we're using Bermuda as the example. The Bermuda goes dormant, turns brown. You've overseeded with the rye, either annual or perennial, based on your preference or customer's preference. It comes up, you've got this green, lush lawn that's gonna last through the winter. And then when the hot weather gets here in the spring, that rye grass is gonna die about the same time or maybe a little sooner than that Bermuda grass starts turning green. So it gives the client a green grass throughout the year if they have a problem with that tan brownish dormant grass uh, through the winter. All right, cool season grasses. We're looking at the same chart as we did for warm season grasses. Like I said, we're right on that transition zone. You know, that line almost looks like it goes directly through for Scythe County. It allows us to have warm and cool season grasses. Cool season turf grass adaptation. They grow best in the northern United States. Yes, they're going to grow better in Virginia, Washington, D.C., on up to Maine, better than they are here. But we do have a climate that will allow for, for a good cool season grass. Tall fescue, fine fescues, probably used more extensively uh, than any other grass here in Forsyth County. But the optimal temperature range for this growth is between 60 and 75 degrees. The winter hardiness and other characteristics vary among species and cultivars. Um, tall fescue, it's probably what everybody in this class has in their yard right now. Uh, we plug it and seed it every fall. Looks great throughout the winter, looks great through the spring. When it gets hot, it's going to start browning out, it's going to start looking weak, it's going to start looking thin. It's because it's a cool season grass. It grows better in cooler climates. We can, however, have a cool season lawn, even though it got 100 degrees this weekend. You know, the lawn stops growing. You don't have to mow it as much when it's hot, but it's going to protect itself. And when it cools up a little bit, it's going to come back. But still, because we're in that transition zone, people plug and seed every fall to get that healthier stand and have that good looking grass through Christmas and through the spring until it gets warmer again and it starts looking a little weak. Irrigation, aeration, all that helps during the hot months. You know, if the roots can get air and definitely get that water, uh, your cool season grass will even look, you know, halfway decent through the summer. Kentucky uh, bluegrass. The characteristic, it's widely used on lawns, sport fields, and golf course fairways, has a vigorous rhizome system, uh, many strengths and abilities due to the uh, availability of over a hundred cultivars. A hundred different types of this grass, people. Uh, has poor shade tolerance and uh, a slow establishment rate are uh, two common weaknesses. I actually have part of this uh, in my lawn. It's where my grandmother had sowed it years ago, or my grandfather. Um, but it's exactly right. For some reason, um, it's only growing underneath the, our trees. And that's probably because that's the closest area to the house. They sowed this grass when the trees were real small. And now that the maple trees are taken off and created shade all over the house, um, the grass isn't doing so well. It's there, but it's not as thick if it was in the sun. Uh, it is a spreader, but it takes forever. Uh, you know, I notice, you know, from the time I've lived there that some of it is spread out in the yard. Will it ever cover my entire lawn? Not, not in my lifetime. Um, very expensive to sow, but it, it's, it's still worth it. It's probably one of my favorite grasses. It is the absolute best grass to walk in barefooted. You can't beat it. It is almost like a carpet. Um, but, uh, you know, I am lucky to have it in my yard. I never overseed over this um, uh, with a fescue or anything. I'm just kind of letting it go. I have cut down one tree that's allowed some more light in. I need to take down another one. And uh, it, it may do a whole lot better. Um, but, uh, you know, 
the poor shade tolerance hurts it and the fact that it's uh, a slow establishment rate or probably uh, why people don't go with it as much as, as they really should. But to walk on it barefooted, it'd be the only lawn that you would want to ever have. All right, your rough bluegrass, it's uh, an excellent cold tolerant and it's pretty good in the shade. Um, it's poor heat, drought, and wear tolerance and used primarily in wet, shady areas. Um, um, sad thing about this you know wet area you're not gonna be walking in it barefooted to uh, to feel how good it feels to to be barefooted with it uh, but it does you know like um, can we stand the cooler temperatures a lot more doesn't like the heat um, but it's pretty good for drought and wear um, so get a wet um, wet area that likes drought uh, drought resistant grass you know it's kind of contradictory to say that but uh, um, you know it's what you'd want to go for all right annual bluegrass poana uh, there are two types of poana you have the, uh, the the anna and the reptans the former is the uh, the true uh, annual dying after seed production in the spring the latter uh, is a weak perennial sometimes called creeping bluegrass many other biotopes, uh, biotypes exist. Um, we had a problem or infestation of this grass on uh, one of the croquet courts we took care of at Arbor Acres. Um, you would get this poana come up and we would spray for it and uh, get rid of it and actually have the, uh, the hybrid Bermuda. Um, it's one of these other grasses that hey can be a weed or can be a luxurious, uh, luxury grass depending on how you take care of it. Some people consider this weed, but then again, golf courses use it. Your annual type is considered a weed because it is intolerant of drought, heat, and the cold, and dies out readily. Persistent because it produces large amounts of seed. It's going to take over fairly quick, and it's particularly persistent in closely mown turf such as that found on golf courses. Uh, you know, we mowed the, the croquet court three times a week, mowed it short, so it spread very quickly. All right, your perennial type has your fine leaf texture, very high density, it means it grows real close together. It's going to produce your short stalins and your fewer seeds than the annual type uh, bluegrass. It is a better, uh, has a better tolerance of the environmental conditions than the annual type. <coughs> and for that reason, this is the type of uh, bluegrass that we're going to find on the greens, referred to as your greens type bluegrass. Um, this isn't the type of weed, as I mentioned, that came up in the, uh, uh, the croquet court. It actually had the annual that spread really fast. It was considered a weed because we had the hybrid Bermuda it was invasive to it. All right, your perennial ryegrass. We've discussed this a little bit uh, in, a, in a few uh, slides before this, but uh, is non-creeping. It is a bunch type grass. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't have the stalins and rhizomes. It's, um, but it bunches up, uh, has a uh, rapid establishment rate, which means, you know, guys, you can sow this and it's gonna be up in two or three days. You're gonna see some some green coming up through your wheat straw. Um, does have some cold hardiness problems, which means if it gets really cold, uh, it may knock it back a little bit, but it wears well and can be mowed uh, relatively close. It's used on lawns, sports fields, and golf course fairways. It's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an overseeder and it's often mixed with Kentucky bluegrass. Um, gives you a little bit of color uh, right off the bat, uh, it is seen in some of your fine fescues and your bluegrass mixes. Um, you know, my dad's big on not having it in his mixture. You know, he's he's all about getting the uh, getting the fescue well established and not needing the, the ryegrass. And I agree with that. Uh, but again, it all goes back to personal preference. Um, you'll see the the perennial rye, uh, even the annual rye used in um, uh, erosion control because it comes up quick or you've got a builder that's built a house he wants the grass to come up really quick 
it's going to be a rye grass, and he's going to mix it with, with some other grasses that's going to come in a little bit behind it. Creeping bent grass, um, a golf course green. This is your greens and your tee boxes primarily here. Uh, the characteristics, it is, it's aggressive, it spreads with stallings, it's very cold tolerant. That's what makes it, uh, you know, if you're driving by a golf course in January and you see the tee box and the green, or even the fairways um, green, they've not gone dormant, it's because it's a creeping bent grass. You can mow it close, uh, does have a high maintenance requirement. Like I said, it's used on golf courses, tees and greens. And on weekends like we just had with 100 degree plus temperatures, um, this can kill it. Uh, if you drive by a golf course and you see big fans blowing on the uh, the tee boxes and the greens, that's that's a bent grass. That's a bent grass uh, tee box or green. They're actually having to keep it cool. That air gets real stagnant and holds the heat, so they're circulating air just to to raise the temperature a little bit. Uh, but uh, uh, very expensive. Uh, it's not what you'd want to have in your lawn just for the cost and the high maintenance. You know, it needs the needs the fertilization. It needs to be mowed close, and it needs to be uh, kept cool in in the weather that we've been having recently. All right, your colonial bent grass. Uh, it produces a high density, fine textured turf. It's just like its brother. It tolerates close mowings, but it has weak stallings and rhizomes. It does have some problems with drought and heat tolerance and sometimes we're preferred to creeping bent grass because it requires less maintenance and shows resistance to some disease but primarily used on golf course fairways and tees probably not what we're going to see on the greens of a golf course that's that's the you know the beauty of a golf course is the greens so you're probably not going to see the colonial on it you're going to see the creeping uh, but definitely maybe in the fairways velvet bent grass the characteristic it produces an extremely fine textured very dense highly attractive turf it spreads by stallings and is less aggressive than creeping bent grass and the lack of heat and traffic tolerance can be a uh, can be a problem um, it's sometimes used instead of creeping bent grass on the putting greens because of its good shade and drought tolerance and better resistance to dollar spot um, you know this probably all goes back to the the superintendent of the golf course and what his preferences are so we're not going to get into that these are just the characteristics of that we've looked at three different bent grasses now um, if you have some shade around one of your greens yes use the velvet um, all golf courses are going to be irrigated so we shouldn't have to worry about drought tolerance um, because it's going to get the water and um, but, but this type of bent grass, it, it's resistance to, uh, to dollar spot disease. And we'll see, you know, we'll study that here uh, in the next lecture, uh, the different types of diseases. But uh, you may want to go with this just because of uh, resistance to dollar spot. You know, all comes down to budget, um, the resources that the golf course has, and, and you know, the superintendent's uh, um, personal preference. Tall fescue, my favorite, you know, probably, you know, it's my favorite because it's what I have and it's 95% of what we take care of here in Winston-Salem. Um, the major strengths are its heat, drought, and wear tolerance. You know, you can't, you can't destroy this grass. Um, yeah, it's hot out there. You're going to see the grass kind of thin out and, you know, look a little brown, but it's going to come back. Um, you know, these 100 degree temperatures that we've had here recently and, you know, haven't had much rain. The grass is browned up a little bit. You're not having to mow it as much, producing little seed heads, but the uh, grass is a little thin. So, you know, uh, plugging and seeding in the fall will help that, but um, very, very good for heat, drought, and wear tolerance. Um, the lack of cold tolerance results in it primarily being used on lawns in the transition zone and southern parts of the cool season zone. That's, that's where we're at, guys. Um, you know, they're probably not going to use the tall fescue way up north. Um, just because of its cold tolerance but you know it works perfect here it's non-spreading it's a bunch type growth uh, it doesn't have the stalins or rhizomes it's 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 
um, almost in clumps or bunch type growth. Uh, has fewer pest problems than most turf grass species, but does not tolerate close mowing. You know, we need to mow this, you know, three and a half to four inches. I'm all about having, you know, the deck of the mower raised higher, um, you know, creates, um, um, best thing about not mowing it so close guys if you if you don't like Bermuda grass in your lawn the shade and shading out the Bermuda is the best way to get rid of it so a higher mowed lawn is going to have less Bermuda grass than any other type of um, uh, cool season grass here uh, the problem is you have people that scalp their tall fescues the Bermuda takes off uh, just overtakes it. You're going to see more weeds. The weed seeds don't have a chance to germinate because of the shade. So um, you know, keep it at three and a half to four inches on the on your uh, um, on your mower. Uh, you'll you'll be a lot happier with your tall fescue lawn. Uh, fine fescues. Um, there are five grasses that are grouped together and called the fine fescues. You have your slender creeping, your strong creeping, your chewings fescue, your hard fescue, and your sheep fescue. Alright, with your fine fescues there are going to be some differences that occur between each of them. Uh, they generally have the same following characteristics. So they're all going to have a fine leaf texture, they're going to be drought and shade tolerant, they're slow to spread, and they have a slow vertical growth. It requires low levels of maintenance. You're not going to have to mow them as much. Um, you're not going to have to aerate or seed much, you know, because they can tolerate that shade. They're not going to get as thin underneath the trees as some of your grasses. Um, so, you know, it's, these are good grasses t to have. Um, you'll see a lot of your um, your seed um, warehouses or you know sales place they're going to have a mixture of these fine fescues um, you know you're going to want to all right now we're going to start talking about insect pests and these are just insects of, of turf grasses and I know you guys uh, especially if you're taking this class during the summer um, you're taking this class along with insects and disease. Uh, if you're taking it in the fall, you've either had insects and disease or you're a new student and you'll have it you know, coming up in the summer. Um, so we're not going to spend too much time with this. There's just a few slides on insects. But to begin with, your adult insects have three pair of legs. Uh, insects either have chewing or sucking mouth parts. Uh, in a little bit we're going to figure out which one's worse for turf grass either the chewing or the sucking and then their skeletons are on the outside of their bodies molting is when they dissolve their old exoskeletons and produce new larger ones and then each period between molts is called an instar should be familiar to you if you're taking Lisa's insects and disease class right now Metamorphosis, again, should be all familiar to you either through that class or even this term. You should have heard it before in high school biology um, or if you're taking biology 101 here. You know, you've talked about this before, but insects, they begin their lives as eggs, then they progress through uh, immature stages, and then they become adults. Metamorphosis occurs when there is a change in appearance between the immature and adult stage. If this change is dramatic, for example, a caterpillar to a moth, the insect has complete metamorphosis and the immatures are called larvae. If the change is relatively simple, such as the appearance of wings on the adult, the insect has gradual metamorphosis and the immatures are called nymphs. All should be very familiar to you, especially in the summer class taking insects and disease. The life cycle of a chinch bug is an example of simple metamorphosis. It begins with A, the egg, followed by five immature stages, and finally the adult. And here we see those stages A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Starting out first and ended up with the, the mature bug down there at G. So take a look at this slide, the previous slide, put the two together and you're seeing simple metamorphosis. 
All right, metamorphosis continued. The life cycle of the European chafer from the left, and you'll see this in the next slide. You have the egg, the first instar larva, the second instar larva, third instar, then perpetual stage, pupa, and then the adult. You'll see this in the next slide. And there we're seeing it just in the previous slide. We have the egg, first instar, second instar, third instar, perpetual stage, pupa, and finally the adult. All right, insect injury. Insects injure, injure turf grass primarily by chewing plant tissue or sucking the juices from the leaves and stems. The amount of injury depends on the size of the pest population. It all comes back to thresholds, as we remember from, uh, from applying pesticides uh, correctly. You know, how much of this can we stand? Is it just a little bit? You know, is it just a little bit aesthetically displeasing? Or is it destroyed the whole lawn? Do we need to take, you know, do we need to, uh, to invest in an insecticide? Mm -hmm. So it all goes back to how much or how many of the, uh, the pests that we see and uh, the amount of injury that these great numbers or small numbers are creating for our clients. The, uh, the size of the insect population can be affected by uh, the speed of its reproduction rate. Can it have a, you know, a lot of babies really quick? Uh, the insecticide applications or favorable or unfavorable weather conditions. All that plays into role on how big uh, our infestation can be. Our root feeding insects, grubs, you know, you always hear of grubs uh, being a big problem in lawns, but the, the grubs are the larvae of beetles such as the mask chafer or the Japanese beetle. Mole crickets, uh, there are a species of cricket that lives in the soil. Wire worms are the larvae of, uh, of click beetles. Then you have ground pearls that are piercing, sucking scale insects that are covered by a waxy shell. All these are root feeding insects on the turf. Uh, and you can tell uh, when you have a problem is when you go and you, you can actually take a handful of grass and just pull it up real easy. You know, you've got, you've got an insect in the ground that's eating those roots and allowing you to, to pick the grass up really, uh, really easily. You know, if you, if you take a handful of grass, you shouldn't be able to pull handfuls up without, you know, grabbing onto it and the grass breaking off. If you're pulling out big chunks very easily, you've got an insect problem. All right, leaf and stem feeders, chinch bugs. They injure the plants by sucking the juices from the tissue and injecting a toxic fluid into the xylem. Your sod webworms, your cutworms, and army worms are caterpillars that chew on leaf tissue. You know, several, actually a couple summers ago, a big, big thing with army worms. Uh, you know, new grass, sowing the new grass. As soon as it comes up, army worms, you know, ate the whole thing. Then we have a wax covered scale insect, um, such as the Bermuda grass scale, that suck the plant juices. All right, also we have an annual bluegrass weevil that is a beetle that primarily feeds on poana. Others include leaf hoppers, grasshoppers, fruit flies, and aphids. Control. A healthy, well maintained grass will be more likely to recover from insect injury. You have a well established lawn that's getting the nutrients that it's needed, that's getting the air to the roots, getting water to the roots. If there is uh, an infestation of an insect and there is some damage, the, the turf that was healthy to begin with will more likely recover a whole lot more quickly and recover, period. Um, Insecticides are not normally used until it is determined that the insect population is large enough to potentially cause unacceptable levels of injury or reaches that threshold. Some of the cultivars of turf grasses can resist uh, insect injury. And you know, the, the, the lab guys, the coat guys, they're always working on new cultivars that are resistant to these pests and diseases that we'll study uh, in the next lecture. And non-traditional insecticides such as 
insect growth regulators are being developed. Uh, we'll always continually see new products that are available to us for, uh, for insects on our turf grasses. Insecticide use. To use insecticides effectively, the turf manager must be aware of the thresholds and when to look for pests. Understand what stage the insect's life cycle is uh, to best determine how to control it. And then pick the least toxic insecticide that will be effective. Um, and I'd say that middle one there, understanding what stage the insect's life cycle is, um, you know, if you don't understand how this insect um, you know, start to finish its life cycle, how are you going to determine the correct insecticide uh, to use? And, and, and the good thing about this, you know, guys, if, if you have any questions, you can always call Cooperative Extension. You can always take one of the insects, you know, take a picture, uh, you know, these new cell phones, send it to, um, uh, you know, to one of your salesmen, you know, these landscape supply houses they have salesmen that deal directly with you know you you know the salesman may have 20 customers that he's dealing with or you know probably more than that but you know he's there to help you you know he wants to sell you that insecticide that's going to get rid of so they're, they're going to identify it for you so use the resources that you have all right and also with insecticides you need to understand the characteristics of how it will work for example if the insecticide is broken down by sunlight you'll need to apply it at night. Um, if it doesn't need to have irrigation on it, you need to apply the application on days uh, that the irrigation system's not coming on. You need to understand what will actually destroy that insecticide. You don't want to put this chemical on the lawn and it not effectively hit the target that you intended to. You've spent money, uh, you've put pesticides into the environment that didn't need to be so make sure you understand how that insecticide works and that wraps this PowerPoint up please make sure that you read chapters 2 and 3 in your ornamentals and turf pest management book and download the slides I will have them in uh, PDF each slide separately and I'll also have them on a notes page where you can print and uh, um, write some notes on with it so i appreciate it and i will see you guys in lab thank you